thank you to our show sponsors, FMC Preschool, Canola Master, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep what you're looking for today. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am Lindsay Smith, your host of The Agronomist. Welcome to uh, everyone here in the comments. Uh, glad to see so many of you hopping on early. Not one of you commented that I was on time. So I am, my feelings are a little bit hurt, but we are on time. Uh, hi to Jay, or to Ray out in Alberta. We've got uh, Warren Schneckenberger and Janet from out uh, in Eastern Ontario here with me. And John, of course, is here. And I am going to send a special uh, hello to Paisley, who will not comment, but I know he's there. Uh, and Kevin, uh, Happy milking, I guess, as you go. And I heard you're having a, a cavalanche, a cavalanche, is that what you call it? Uh, baby cows everywhere. Okay, that's the important part. All right, so tonight's topic, super excited about this. We are going to talk about how to love your soil and love your soil microbes. And of course, if you do collect those CEU credits, let us know that you watch the broadcast and make sure you get your name in for those CEU credits because this, of course, qualifies for that um, coveted soil and water credit, which is really important. And so, uh, Warren, I'm not two minutes late. We started on time. That's enough. Just time is a construct anyway. Okay, so I am so excited. And I'll have you know that I have been trying to do this episode for a very long time, and it finally worked out. So I will bring in my guests uh, who are going to tell us everything they know in one hour about soy microbes. Just kidding. We could not get through there. Oh, and Lara is here. All right, so I'll bring in my guests, uh, doctors Bobby Helgeson and Carrie uh, Dunfield with the University of Guelph, Bobby, of course, with the University of Saskatchewan. Welcome here. Thanks. Great. Happy to Thanks. Be here. Happy to be here. Okay. And so I learned just before the broadcast that the two of you actually know each other, which is even better and super exciting. Yes. As Lara DeMozak says, it's finally happening. Yes. She has been, she has been trying to get the show happening for, uh, well, not to, not to like stretch it too far, but probably a year. So it's been a while. Okay, so to start off, Carrie, maybe I'll start with you. Um, what is your main area of research? And then I'll ask you a question that will be very difficult to answer. So we'll start with the we'll start with the easy one. Okay. <laughs> so I'm a microbiologist, and I work mostly in soil and egg systems, but I also do some um, other work looking at remediation. And so really. I'm um, an ecologist. I, I, I like to understand what the microbes are doing and who's there and what their roles are in the soil. Which is what we want to learn about. I'm going to save my difficult questions so that Bobby is just as shocked as you are. Okay. Uh, Bobby, tell me about the research you do at the U of S. Um, so similar to Carrie, I'm a microbiologist, a soil microbiologist, uh, and really 98% of my work happens in soil uh, and in agricultural soils to be specific. So I'm a farm kid. I grew up with a passion for agriculture and for farming. Um, and so my work mostly looks at how different agricultural management practices impact soil microbes and their functions. Now everyone knows why I have the two of you here because we're putting it all together. Okay, so here's my difficult question. Bobby, do you have a favorite microbe? No. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. No. Oh, um, come on. No, okay. I think it really depends on what uh, what particular context we're thinking about. So sometimes okay. it's super exciting to look at what all the fungi are doing, and sometimes it's really exciting to just be thinking about denitrifiers and 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 certain groups. But uh, no, I don't think I do have one. Okay, Carrie, can you pick a favorite? Um, I'm going to go with. Uh, a pseudomonas, which is oh. a little um, gram negative uh, type of organism. But the reason I love pseudomonas is because they do a bunch of stuff. So um, they can help plants grow, they can be pathogens, they can, um, they're, they're, they basically cover a bunch of range of things. So I, I think that would be one of my favorites, but I'm also okay. pretty partial to like tardigrades because they're just cute. Yeah. <laughs> <Water bears. laughs> 
There's water bear shirts. There's all oh, sorts of fun stuff. <laughs> like they're amazing. Anyway, okay. So actually, Warren wanted to know if you have microbe stuffy. So that's where you go. You can get microbe shirts. You can get. There's all sorts of good stuff. And actually, um, it seems to be that the entomologists usually win with really fun T-shirts. So we're gonna have to step mm -hmm. up our game here, soil soil people. Okay. All right. So let's dig in literally um, and put some of this together. So my my goal tonight is to at least start uh, to begin this journey into fully understanding or, or better understanding, I should say, what lies beneath, what is down below and working for us. And of course, how what we do as farmers and agronomists, how that impacts those soil populations below. So Carrie, maybe I'll start with you first on the main, if you can walk us through sort of the main types of soil organisms we're talking about when we talk about the soil microbiome. Well, that's a big question because there's mm -hmm. billions and billions of them in there. But um, I guess the categories that we often talk about are, so the bacteria and the fungi, and then there's a whole soil food web. So I would say my research mostly looks at bacteria and fungi, but there's the protozoa and the nematodes and the um, everything else is in, in the soil that all feed and they're all they're all equally important the same as they would be in the above ground food web where um, organisms are feeding off each other and really regulating each other so we understand that like this whole food web is important in in the system so okay yeah so Bobby can you expand on that a little bit of what we mean? by a food web? Is it like, in my mind, I do think about those connections. So being web, but, but then I get hung up on like that graphic and not really thinking about the interactions between some of these soil types. So, so what, what does that really mean as far as what's happening below ground? Um, well, I think it's important to remember that it all starts with photosynthesis. So plants feed it at the, at the very basic level. So, um, you know, it, it's plants bringing energy into an interconnected web of, of life in the soil. And then it's all about who eats who and why and when and where <laughs> and what that means for nutrient cycling and um, like competitive uh, interactions and populations that explode and populations that get outcompeted and, and all of those really complex and sort of tricky to understand um, interactions both between the microbes themselves, but then with the soil environment, which itself is really terrifically and, and sort of fascinatingly complicated as well. So. Right. Okay. So that, this is one of the places where, so in my mind, of course, I'm just imagining like a very miniature, like Game of Thrones type thing where you've got like different factions and all sorts of, you know, whatever, but maybe perhaps somewhat less fantastical, but then you bring in the soil component as well. So we've got soil microbes, the living sort of part, but then we also have soil particles that of course are going to play a key role in that. So Carrie, how, how does that matter? How does soil, the actual soil particles and the soil makeup actually impact soil microbes and vice versa? It's actually incredibly important. And I think that that's why um, that's part of the thing. It is hard to get your head around and it's actually even stranger because soil aggregation or those particles that you're talking about are really held together by like bacteria, biofilms, those things that are sticking clay particles together and fungal hyphae that are actually like physically holding the soils together. But so those aggregates that we call them are like forming little pores that can allow certain sizes of microorganisms to get in there and, and proliferate. And so it's really, it's, it's, it's allowing these little niches and uh, communities to survive and be protected from predators. Um, or maybe it, uh, it's allowing oxygen and water to, or nutrients um, to get in and out. And so it's driving what organisms can live there and, and survive. So it's really that we call it spatial heterogeneity of the soil um, and the structure that's actually allowing all these organisms to actually live together and, and be so diverse. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, um, if you're a farmer and you look out at your field, you know that on a large scale, there's also a ton of variability on a landscape scale. So right. there's, you know, what you see in the field. So uh, 
depression or a, a knoll, that's also going to drive soil properties that are going to drive the type of organisms that are there. So Bobby, when I think Saskatchewan, I also think um, salinity. And maybe that's not fair, uh, but, on the, but on the prairies in general, it seems to be certainly one of those things that will happen. So that, of course, then brings in the chemical part of this, right? So how, on a, on a, on a general level, how then do we start to work in exactly that, some of those chemical properties, but also things that we do and manage that can make things worse or better for our soil microbes? Oh boy. Um, well, I mean, I think the salinity that you're referring to here is driven by the really intense water dynamics that we have, right? So, right. Um, you know, uh, deep water being brought up to the surface brings salts with it. And then when the soils dry out, those salt deposits get left uh, at the near surface where they cause problems for plant growth. Um, but thinking sort of more specifically about the soil matrix and how it dictates chemistry, I always think about um, about soil texture and the, the distribution of sand, silt and clay and how impactful that is for all the kinds of chemistry that happens in our soil. So clay is being really reactive, sand's being very inert and it all tying back to what Carrie talked about in terms of how soil structure is built. So. Clay, clay particles are very reactive. They are really important for micropores, but then sand, sandy soil is less reactive and, and tend to form less cohesive soil structure. So um, all of this biology, physics, and chemistry interacting to, to make the wonderful and fascinating world below ground. Mm -hmm. This is the thing I love is that like we there's so many and I'm a little bit jealous of your jobs to be honest that there's just so many directions that we can go and so tonight obviously we are this is you know sort of a 101 trying to get some basics and get some conversations going and I do want to tie it back to at least some of the management decisions that we have to make but recognizing we are not going to cover even a teeny little bit of the depth of what we could. So by all means, everyone, I encourage you, yes, ask your questions, but this is the topic we're gonna to come to over and over. Um, but uh, I have I have some questions I wanna ask, but of course, uh, out in the audience, those sorts of things, because I know we're gonna get questions about, or if no one is brave enough, because when you're talking to um, soil scientists, most people don't wanna bring up tillage, but I'm gonna bring up tillage. Um, because <laughs> tillage, of course, is a fact of life in, in agricultural systems, to varying degrees and you know certainly right now in Ontario we're having a lot of these discussions about you know we add cover crops into the system to keep those living roots but um, you know we might still be doing the same or, or maybe even more tillage there are all these trade-offs so I, I'll ask the question can or how do we use tillage in a system and still keep our soil microbes happy Carrie I'll maybe start with you on that one well, <laughs> we've actually done a lot of research at, at Guelph on, you know, tillage and crop rotation and, um, and the, I mean, I guess what I would say is what we've seen is if you have like a major tillage event where you're having inversion, you definitely are changing your soil microbial community. Um, for the most part, you're breaking up those fungal hyphal networks. And so there's microorganisms that um, they're still going to be there. They're going to survive, but they'll definitely, they'll change compared to if you had no tillage in the system. Um, and, and so I would say um, what we've seen is that um, if you rotate your crops and um, maybe add a cover crop in the system, um, along with tillage, you can kind of uh, moderate some of the some of the changes that we see in the microbial community that you see with tillage. And so it's a combination of things that I think you need to um, play around with and, and decide what works best for your system. Because obviously, in some cases, there's tillage is, is required to, to grow crops. So um, it's just a matter of minimizing if, if possible. So now, Bobby, it's perhaps not fair, but in Saskatchewan, of course, Farmers have done an amazing job at reducing, not eliminating by any stretch, but reducing tillage. Uh, but definitely a challenge to try and keep living roots in the system for the entire growing season. So a bit of a change there. So how then, um, when you're thinking about management of land and management of soil, how do you sort of broach that tillage uh, and root question? 
Um, well, I think it's really all about trying to maintain and build soil organic matter. So we know that when we till, we completely change the physical environment. And so we redistribute resources, take soil organic matter that was previously protected from microbial breakdown and make it available. Um, and so we get kind of a feeding frenzy and that breaks down a whole bunch of, of soil organic matter. Um, but I think that we have to sort of take the long-term view. So sometimes tillage is necessary. And if we till, we will definitely cause that accelerated breakdown, temporary accelerated breakdown of organic matter through this microbial feeding frenzy. Some populations just go bananas. They do a really great job of taking advantage of that situation. And then those populations crash and somebody else comes eat, comes in and, and, and eats them, right? So um, I think it's really about taking a long-term view in terms of combined crop rotation, um, trying to bring as much residue carbon, whether that's living, living, I, I guess living roots sort of sounds like a contradiction when I say residue, but as much plant carbon into the system as you can. Our growing season here is short. And so trying to find space on the shoulders of an annual cash crop is, is definitely a challenge. And then moisture conditions sometimes can create other, other challenges for that as well. Fantastic. Okay, we're going to get into carbon and, and driving the cycle and these sorts of things. But Lara, and neither of you should be surprised that Lara comes up with a fantastic question um, of, is it better to have diversity of soil microbes or an abundance of soil microbes? So <laughs> is there is there a quality versus quantity trade-off? Are we that far along in our understanding of, of our soil microbiome? Bobby, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, <laughs> um, well, producer Jay, can we cue slide number one? <laughs> no, <laughs> the on. I think that's a great okay. opportunity to bring it up. Um, yeah. So there's an analogy that I often use when I'm talking about, you know, how we study soil microbial communities and what's important. And so the list on the left is sort of a, a number of essential ecosystem services. And so right now we're talking about decomposition and cycling of organic matter, which is directly related to the regulation of nutrient availability for plant growth gas exchange and carbon storage and on we go down the list. And so both abundance and diversity are important. When I think of abundance, I sort of think about it as the size of the engine below ground that drives all of these really critical ecosystem functions. So it might not be running on all cylinders at all times because you don't need them, but it's that potential capacity that you have to rely on. So the bigger the soil microbial biomass, sort of the bigger that engine is, and it might not all be active all the time, but you've got it there. Diversity, on the other hand, I think of as kind of like resilience in the ecosystem. So um, if we have a diverse population, we have better odds that if the conditions get difficult for one population, another can come in and take over and continue that essential ecosystem service that we need to be delivered across a variety of, of conditions. So um, that little graphic on the bottom, I won't get into sort of uh, get into it too much but um, i think both the abundance and the diversity are critical factors or critical aspects of of sort of building a healthy soil microbiome okay i like it um all right carrie do you agree disagree i would love it if you completely disagree but i highly doubt that that's the case <laughs> but wouldn't that be i no i mean i i I obviously think both are important. I guess I would also maybe add that um, diversity is actually a couple different things when you think about microorganisms. So it's not just um, that you need to have like a high diversity because um, in, in some of our systems, uh, diversity can be equal, but what you need to have is sometimes specific types of organisms that are present in the soil. And so it's really, you need to look at the, the types of organisms there and make sure that you have all those functions available. And so while diversity can be the same in a bunch of soils, um, what you need to make sure is that the organisms that you're interested in that need to be in the system are actually there. So um, I actually have a slide two, slide three, which has some pictures of underwear <laughs> from our long-term <laughs> field trial. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
This is just actually um, a little thing we do um, in, in Ontario, but I think everywhere in Canada. It started, um, the Soil Conservation Society of Canada started, which is like Soil Your Undies. Um, and it's just a little fun way to visualize microbial activity in the soil. So you just bury a pair of cotton underwear, you pull it up and you look for like activity. Um, and so what we did, um, at Guelph is go into our long-term field trials. And uh, this is our Allura field trial. So it's been in place for 40 years. And we know these systems are, um, we know which, which rotations are healthier. Um, so our most diverse rotation, which is a corn, soybean, wheat, winter wheat with red clover and no tillage, probably our healthiest rotation where we see um, good um, resilience and yield over years. And it, what you can see is that um, the, the, the look, what the underwear look like are more decomposed in that, in that trial than say a corn soybean with tillage. But um, how this relates to diversity is we actually did the research and looked at the microbial diversity in, these, in this trial. And what we see is that diversity, actually the number of organisms present as the same in all of these in all of these soils. Mm. Um, what we find is the types of organisms that are present is different. So while there's the same number of organisms, the types of organisms differ, and that kind of relates to diversity. So it's a tiny bit more complicated than just numbers of organisms. It actually depends. We actually there's certain organisms that you want to be there, um, and so that makes it fun yeah. and complicated. Fun, yes. <laughs> complicated but fun um so and that's so this is one of the things and we can talk about this a bit more i'm going to throw to uh to just a quick thank you to our sponsors for in a moment here but um the different roles of the organisms that are there right so we're we're, we're going to have pathogens but we also have I'm going to assume, and maybe you can set me straight on this one, but we're also going to have sort of the balance to that pathogen, right? We may have an organism that keeps that pathogen in check. And then we've got our, our cyclers and, and these sorts of things. So as Bobby said, who eats who and when um, is really like this. It's blowing my mind a little bit because, of course, they don't just all eat each other necessarily just over and over. There's like growth and Anyway, okay, so we're going to get to that in a minute, just um, to dig into that. But just quickly, I do want to send a quick uh, thank you to our show sponsors for the evening. Our sponsors tonight are Adama Canada, FMC Preschool, and Canola Master. We call ourselves Canola Master because we want every canola grower to achieve growing perfection. Master your canola with the 160 acres of gold giveaway. Enter today at canolamaster.ca. Conditions apply. All right. I will admit it is very difficult not to be using as many soil puns as possible, um, but a few of them are going to get in there. And so, yes, Scott, we're just scratching the surface of this topic tonight. Okay. Dr. Dave Hooker has a great question, and I, I'm, I hope he's okay if I make a friendly amendment to it slightly, but increasing soil biodiversity seems to be a popular question, but how important is it? Which is not exactly the same question as as quantity over quality, because I want to bring this into the rotation discussion. So we know that just like you shared, Carrie, with the soil your undies, we know that a diverse crop rotation means more microbial microbial activity, gives us what we would consider healthier soil. And so along this quest, why? Why is soil biodiversity, which can either be supported or let's say is supported by crop biodiversity, why why does that actually happen? Why do our micro populations change based on the crop that's grown? Bobby, I'll start with you. Uh, I think the most important driving factor is the diversity of incoming food. So um, it's the types, I mean, I, I like to say like microbes like us do best with a balanced diet. And so if we feed them the same thing over and over and over and over again, it creates way more opportunity for example, for pathogens to take over, but it's also less balanced nutrition overall, even if we're supplementing with good soil test and, you know, um, and an appropriate application of fertilizers, just having those different kinds of plants, a legume, for example, in rotation, brings diversity to the food sources that are incoming. And I think that's the most important part 
um, of boosting soil health with crop rotation. We've done some work in long-term crop rotations and we're surprised to find that when the crop is alive and growing, the microbial diversity in different long-term rotation soils was surprisingly similar <laughs> because the plant, the living plant that was there right today, whether it's wheat from a long-term rotation or wheat from continuous wheat for decades, it was still wheat was the main source of food in that moment. And so it was supporting a very similar looking community. But when we looked post-harvest, those community, the diversity and their structure really started to separate. And what was far more important was their functional diversity was very, very different. So the way that they were uh, doing their job and, and the implications for nutrient cycling um, were really different in those soils. So soil organic matter quality was higher in rotation soils, for example. So I think it's mostly about the food source as a support for the microbial communities that are there. Bobby, you've just further complicated things by saying there's a difference in soil organic carbon quality. So just mm -hmm. you're blowing my mind and I would prefer if you could only do that one to two more times this evening because I only <laughs> have so much paper to write notes. Um, okay, and the questions are, are are trickling in, which is fantastic. And there are some big ones on here. So we're going to try and get through as many as we can. But Carrie, I'll put it to you. Why is it that changing the crop uh, in the rotation, so under those Ontario conditions, why is adding winter wheat in there, adding that red clover in there? What is driving that improvement to the next crop that follows or to the, the crop yields that come after? Well, I think you're exactly right. The the difference in the carbon inputs that are feeding those microbial communities is different. Um, I guess I'm just going to spin it a little bit um, and think about it a little bit different than when you say, why is diversity important, biodiversity important? Um, I think it's important to remember that microbial communities are tend to be quite simplified. So they actually need to work with partners. So they work in these consortiums. So they need to have, so say you ha have a carbon input, there's usually like multiple microbial communities that need to work together to break down a plant residue into a carbon source. So you need to have that diversity just to get from like a plant residue into like carbon and being incorporated into soil or nutrients. And so diversity is important just for that, where you there's multiple players, one organism can't do it all in the soil, they they very much work together. Um, they tend to have like one enzyme and they work as a community. So it's a little bit different way to think about it, but I think that's one of the reasons we really need diversity. When we talk about resilience because they, these they're kind of all players on a team. Okay, and that actually plays into Francois Tardif has asked a couple questions and I think that's sort of what we're coming around to is this importance of how these soil microbes all work uh, together when they play nice and I'm Sometimes they don't, that's okay too, because then that's food. But um, quickly, because everyone knows how much I love brown gold. So Kevin out in BC, he's out in the Fraser Valley and he has an abundance, okay, he not personally, his farm has an abundance of manure. And does that add to microbial activity? Um, or so what impact, I guess, does manure have on our soil microbe populations, good or bad? Who wants to start with this one? <laughs> Neither. <laughs> okay, Kim. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I'll go with you I think incorporate. I think I think definitely incorporating um, animal products into into a, a system is is incredibly incredibly important. I think putting organic material back into the soils is um, super helpful, especially in any kind of low organic matter soils. Um, so whether it's cycles, whether you're um, adding plant residues back right directly onto the soil or keeping them without tillage or whether it's cycling through a cow and back into the into the field i think it's all just really important is getting that uh, organic matter back so okay that's good so it, it really yeah so is it and bobby i guess i'll go with you is it really about the 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 carbon the organic matter going back in or do we do we see a benefit from it being just manure in general having all sorts of lovely stuff in it uh, that, we can't, that we can't see, uh, does that actually help or hinder our soil micro populations? Yeah, I mean, I think food is food and manure has a what we call a narrower carbon to nitrogen ratio than a lot of plant matter, not legumes necessarily, but 
Um, so having that nitrogen rich organic matter coming in can stimulate microbial populations that can take advantage of available carbon in the manure and available nitrogen that's there and ready to be assimilated or taken up um, on the day it's applied. But certainly it's, it's, it's very complicated when we start thinking about how manure can be managed differently and the impacts that, that would have on microbial communities in, in the soil where it's been land applied. We know there are differences and that's because of the way that the nutrition in the manure changes based on how it's handled. So um, manure is not necessarily, I mean, it's not all created equally, right? It, it's very many, it's a spectrum of different products that we're applying as organic matter to the soil, but all, all organic matter nonetheless. Right. Okay. All right. So uh, Francois got some great questions here. Um, they're different but similar. So I'll start with the first one. So speaking of increased diversity, could you have synergy among various microorganism species um, that you wouldn't necessarily ha have if you had an abundance of a, of a few species? So along those lines, Carrie, that, that you were talking about how these microbes, you know, one doesn't do it all necessarily. They, they work together and these are systems. Um, so do we see synergies? Do we see where, you know, one plus one equals three within our microbe systems? Oh, Francois, you're getting tricky now. <laughs> but <laughs> this is where um, this is where sometimes microbes kind of blow your mind because you think that. Uh, so we have to remember this is still research going on, and we don't always know what what's happening in the system. But because sometimes we go out into a system, and I say this is going to have the highest. This, this is definitely the best soil. It's going to have the highest diversity for sure, and it doesn't it has kind of like a moderate diversity. And I think what Francois is getting at is a little bit like that. I think we need a little bit of balance um, where there's kind of uh, a lot of kind of moderately happy microbes balanced, it, balanced in the system. Um, and so, it, but this is kind of a surprise even, even sometimes to us because exactly what you said is like you expect in some systems that you have high plant diversity and lots of nutrients you think you're going to get the highest microbial diversity and sometimes that's not what we find we actually find kind, kind of these systems that you think are the poorest soil system that has like really high diversity so so there is i think a synergy happening and i don't know that we have a total handle on it but we understand that like these organisms are working together in kind of these networks and they're all connected and it's kind of like higher level organisms where you probably have keystone species that are controlling other species and it's really complicated but um mm -hmm. but i think Francois is getting at getting at yes. that question. he also has apologized which is hilarious <laughs> i know yeah. where you live <laughs> <laughs> exactly i was gonna say you can get him back later he will actually be on next week's show um okay. so feel free to tune in and offer up your hardest question all right bobby similar question to you though is um or or building from that do, are you surprised at times by what the tests will tell you or what you find from some of the soil samples that you look at when you had an expectation of you know hey this should be okay and then doesn't always add up. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I had a fantastic uh, formative lesson of that early in my PhD. I, I studied long-term no-till and, and conventionally tilled soils to look at microbial community profiling. And when I started out, I had been doing a bunch of research on greenhouse gases. So I wanted to understand fungal production of nitrous oxide. So I thought I'm going to go into no-till systems where fungal dominance is well known, right? Fungi dominate in no-till because we're not we're not tilling them. And step one was demonstrate fungal dominance in no-till. And it turns out that in Saskatchewan and Alberta, long-term no-till cells, I didn't find that. <laughs> and it was like, oh, wow. No. Okay, well, that's inconvenient because that just blew up my plan and my thesis. Um, but I think what had happened was just different tools can reveal information in different ways. And so the kinds of tools that we were using showed us something slightly different about the dynamic of fungi and bacteria in, in long-term no-till soils than the tools that had built this um, pretty broadly accepted uh, um, visualization of how those communities were working. Okay. And so, yeah, it happens often. I mean, I'll go back again to like, we looked at diverse crop rotations compared to long-term cereal monocultures and found way less difference than we expected under the living plant, because it turns out that the 
source of food every day for those microbes was that plant. And so it was more complicated than what we expected when we started out. Right. And, and so that, so A, I love that you called it inconvenient when your entire <laughs> thesis goes out the window. I think that's an understatement, but anyway. Um, but yeah, the second part to that is, so understanding or trying to wrap our heads around the importance of that food source, of that of having a plant there. And, and I think to me, it's it's about, in my mind, it's about visualizing exactly that, that this is sort of another whole life below ground that is gonna have its own cycles of living and, and dying and prospering and failing and, so what we see above ground is only, you know, a symptom of that, let's say, but there are all these other populations below that are doing all these things. Okay, so so I do want to work in, and we've got some, some great comments coming in um, as well, that, um, so this is, Warren is sort of following up on this, so Bobby, I'll just ask for clarity on this. So long-term no-till growers say that tilled soils are microbe dominant um, I don't know what, and no-tills are fungal dominant. So I'm guessing, so same idea. And that is not what you have found necessarily, or do we just have different tests that tell us different stories now? Yeah, so I think the, the long-term accepted view is that no-till, or sorry, conventionally tilled soils become bacterially dominant or, or um, uh, dominated by organisms that sort of live hard and fast and die equally as hard and fast. And so it goes back to that feeding frenzy concept that I mentioned earlier, right? When you disturb the soil's physical structure, make all this food physically available that used to be protected in those all important aggregates. Um, with our work or with my PhD work, what we saw was that when we looked at living microbial biomass, fungal and bacterial, both populations increased in their abundance equally in no-till. And so fungi didn't dominate. If you looked at, um, if you took a, a soil sample and put it under a microscope and looked at the amount of bacterial biomass and fungal biomass there, um, traditionally what was seen was they would see more fungi in no-till soils than conventional till soils. But the dyes that they were using weren't looking at viable organisms. And so I think it was a reflection both of not disturbing fungal hyphae, not ripping them apart, but also even once fungi were dead, those hyphae weren't decomposing as fast. They weren't being consumed by the food web as fast. So, um, so in our Western Canadian soils, which are really quite dry and, and when, you, when you don't till it really slows down decomposition of the surface, we were, um, when you looked only at the active part of the microbial community, we saw an increase in both bacteria and fungi, not a preference for fungi. And it would be different in a, in a wetter climate, I think. Right. Um, and certainly where tillage practices themselves, what no-till versus conventional till means in Saskatchewan is different than no-till compared to the moldboard plow in other places. So lots of context needs to be considered when you're trying to sort out how it all works. But mm -hmm. So Ray says these are James Dean microbes living fast and dying young. <laughs> Um, I was thinking more like Las Vegas, Ray, but yeah, you're right. James Dean is better. Okay. So Karen, yeah, walk us through a little bit of this as well. So, so Warren is here in Eastern Ontario. Um, so sort of from an Ontario context, thinking about this, yes, we have wetter and soils, a longer growing season. So we've got more opportunity for either faster or, or more cycling and more population changes. So do we, what do we see in Ontario soils in, in some of these scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I I worked on uh, with Dave Dave Hooker uh, here and on his tr long term trial in Ontario, and we worked at the other University of Guelph long term trials where you have lots of tillage, and I think what um, Bobby says is holds true here too is that um, the traditional idea of that you're just knocking out fungi with tillage completely. Um, doesn't really hold true now that we have like DNA analysis and we can really get at like what organisms are there. Um, what might be true is that we're definitely changing the fungi that are there. So in a tilled system, we might be changing, maybe there's less mycorrhizal fungi, which we know are beneficial to plants. There's tons of fungal pathogens. And so, you know, you don't necessarily want to dominate with a fungal pathogen population. So what we see is that we shift the types of fungi that are there, but we don't really knock them out totally. Um, they're still there, different different organisms are present. So um, it's the bacterial fungal ratio is um, 
now that we have like molecular tools to really get at who's there, it's a, it's not quite as, it doesn't quite hold as true as what we first thought. Okay. So there's a few things coming in that I want to address here. So one, Gord Spack Snyder has a great question about um, root exudates, which I do want to talk about a little bit. And a lot of people have asked about products, but I want to put this out there for tonight. Uh, we're not really going to touch on products that is going to be an upcoming episode. So I don't want anyone to think I'm ignoring you or those sorts of things, but I, I am being somewhat um, strategic in how I want to do these episodes is I, I want to use them as building blocks one to the other. So tonight's episode is really focused on what's in the soil and how they work together so that we build our understanding of that before we start to think about what putting products into these systems. So I'm, I, to everyone who has asked the question, please hold that question for the for the episode that we have that we're going to have some experts on to talk about products and product interactions and those sorts of things. So keep all those great questions in mind as, in the context of this conversation, uh, but we're not going to tackle that so much tonight. Now, I do want to talk about root exudates, though. So I, I want to talk about sort of that soil root, but also microbe root interactions. So what do we as managers, so as agronomists or as farmers who are, are making the decisions on the land as far as tillage or seeding implements or where the fertilizer is going to go and how much and all those things, um, how important is the root sort of interaction with the soil microbes? Um, what what all happens in that little zone? Bobby, do you want to start or care? <laughs> I can start. Um... Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the, the root carbon, the, those rhizo deposits, whether it's, you know, bits of actual root tissue or far more importantly, usually or more abundant is, is root exudates are really important for structuring the microbial community that lives right adjacent to the plant root. And so I saw uh, the word recruit in the chat, and I think that we do definitely think that plants recruit microorganisms using their root exudates. We're still trying to unravel exactly how strategic that is. The soil has, you know, tens of thousands of different species waiting there to be recruited. So simply creating an environment with lots of readily available sugar is going to recruit some kinds of organisms, but not in a particularly strategic way. We also know if we think about the relationship between a legume and a rhizobium, for example, that the legumes, uh, you know, exudes a very specific signal that can only sort of be matched by the rhizobium, which sends a very specific signal back in order to establish a successful uh, uh, and uh, a successful symbiosis. So it, I think it ranges the whole spectrum from like, I'm going to drop a bunch of sugar into the environment to create a feeding frenzy around my root, which will hopefully um, result in more nitrogen being made available right next to where I'm growing, you know, me being the plant, um, to things that are very more sophisticated, like using specific compounds and, and two-way signaling systems, the rhizobium legume interaction being an example of one of those so that we, we understand more about than we do about more generalist populations in the rhizosphere. Mm -hmm. Carrie, do, so do roots talk to microbes? Because I feel like <laughs> they do. They like yeah, lure I them with so. sugar. I, yeah. we actually, I think I, I have a slide too. Um, we wrote a paper um, and we called it, it takes three to tango. And what we meant by that is that it's really this interaction between the microbes and the plant and the soil and all those three things come together to drive um, these plant beneficial microbial populations is what we were thinking about in this case. But um, so it's actually an area that um, hasn't been really delved into a lot, but I think more and more this idea of working with like crop breeders and thinking about, can we start selecting microorganisms to work with specific crops? Generally, we've um, traditionally ignored you know, soil microbes have been ignored by crop breeders. <laughs> um, and so I think there is there is this idea that, I mean, we understand plants can recruit and don't understand the methodology other than like some certain microbes like rhizobium that we understand it's very, very specific. So I think there's a huge area there. And some of the, some of the things that we find are unexpected in the soil with like say microbial inoculants, we're not gonna talk about it today, but 
um, might be because we don't really understand what the plants are doing themselves and how much control the plants actually have, which they probably have a lot more than we, we think they have. So this is what this is part of what is fascinating to me is that there's so much we are learning and probably my favorite thing about agriculture in general is as soon as you think you learn something you have five more questions that came from the thing you just learned so it is the it is the eternal um asking of questions and learning more and learning what we don't know um which is pretty fascinating as well okay i there's a few other questions and comments that come in and i want to stick with this talk, topic but i do want to uh one more time one last time tonight uh thank our sponsors for tonight's show a big thank you to our sponsors tonight out of my canada canola master and fmc preschool Weeds constantly evolve, but so can your integrated pest management strategies. Knowing the latest weed pressures, resistance trends, application techniques, management strategies, herbicide science, and more gives you tools for a proactive, agronomically responsible response. Go to www.fmcpreschool.com for recorded webinars from field experts and curated articles. fmcpreschool.com, your knowledge, your business, your success. Oh goodness, there are some good, some good comments coming in. Also, some hilarious ones, including I apparently need to get on the meme generator uh, because Warren is thinking exactly what I'm thinking. Okay, but Jana's got a great question here: uh, chicken and egg scenario. So, what came first, the chicken or the egg? So, our um, is fun is fungi first, fungi first in the sequence of food degradation, or bacteria more important for root exudate? What do we think? Bobby, go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, so again, I think like in the past, there was the idea that there was a succession and that it usually started with bacteria. And then as what was left became more complicated, fungi had a more important role. Um, but we use this tool here called a stable isotope quite a bit in the Department of Cell Science where I work. Um, and so we can take this carbon-13, this stable isotope tracer, and track it all. We can watch plants assimilate it through photosynthesis, send it out their roots, feed microorganisms, stabilize it in the soil. It's really, really, really powerful tool. And so we've actually measured fungal uptake of carbon-13 directly from the plant, which would be coming from root exudates very, very quickly after we've added it. So, um, so again, as our toolkit gets more sophisticated, we have better resolution when we're trying to study how all of these, you know, interactions and complex ecology works together. So um, I, that wasn't a particularly specific answer, but I think Thinking of it like a web is the best way to go, right? There are some fungi that can probably hop right in there. They have the, the metabolic machinery to eat readily available carbon, just like bacteria and who out competes them might just be about who's there first, uh, or it might be more complicated than that. So, Yeah. All right. Um, the theme of the show often is it depends. So that fits right in there with, <laughs> yeah, see, look at that. It depends. <laughs> Um, that, yeah, that is a very common thing here. Um, okay, so so Dr. Herker put, picks up on something that I want to talk about, functional diversity. So when we're talking about decisions an agronomist can, can offer or uh, that, a, that a farmer has to decide, are there beyond, because we're not talking products right now, but if we're trying to support the good guys below, below soil, knowing that maybe there are some fungal pathogens or these sorts of things that are there, what can we do in our management strategies to potentially support the good guys? Carrie, I'll start with you. Is there a magical thing I can do? Well, um, I think that um, I think that I, obviously rotation and adding different different roots types of roots is gonna is helping because you're gonna increase that diversity that we talked about. Um, one thing you might not want to hear <laughs> is that what we find is that if um, basically microbial communities are sort of lazy, so you know if there's a nutrient in their face, they are not gonna bother to you know, solute. so for example, phosphorus, if there's phosphorus readily available, they're not going to bother to solubilize phosphorus out of like from organic material. That's, they're just going to be other populations that outcompete. 
But if you have like a, a decrease in plant available phosphorus um, in the system, you'll find that those microbial communities that solubilize phosphorus will, will increase and then increase their activity and take over. And so I think at some point there's this balance um, for any of the nutrients where, um, where you can see microbial populations taking over and being more active and getting those increases in those functional groups. Um, but they're not going to do it if they don't have to. Hmm. Microbes are lazy, you guys. These are not things that I knew. <laughs> I, I just like I get this idea that that they like they hustle. Um, okay, so uh, Jenna had a question earlier about soil pH. So we haven't really talked about pH all that much yet. Definitely can be a concern for all sorts of reasons. Um, but one of them, of course, is when our pH goes off, then we're all told, uh, you know, the nutrients that are there are not as plant available. So how do we get around this? Um, but in general, Bobby, are there certain soil microbes that love certain pHs or does everybody want to live in the seven or, or <laughs> do we have ones that love, you know, more basic, more acidic? Certainly at the extremes of pH, there are groups that are capable of tolerating it and out competing others. Um, neutral pH is preferred by most organisms. So somewhere between six and seven and a half, Carrie, I, don't, I can't remember what the exact like optimal zone for most microbes is. Anything below four and a half, and you'll see major restrictions on both microbial function and diversity. Like it'll get to the point where some populations just simply can't, can't exist under those conditions. Uh, fungi are generally more tolerant of acid conditions than bacteria. So if we think of a place like the forest floor, where the incoming food, the incoming litter is quite acidic, and generally we have wet conditions that leach cations out, we can end up with more acidic conditions and fungi tend to dominate um, the microbial communities in that environment as an example. But certainly on the extremes of the pH, very, very high and very, very low. Um, there are many, many, many kinds of organisms that can't do well. But I think by and large, other than a, a few sort of extremist groups, everybody's happiest in and around neutral pH, or most are happiest around neutral pH. Okay. I like it. Moderate. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Carrie, that, that, it does bring up a question though, because often what can come out of that. So obviously we have sort of our overall pH that we're thinking about in a field and maybe we're adding lime and we're trying to correct some of that here in Ontario. But then we think on like more of a micro level, if we think about when we're putting in, when we're say putting down fertilizer or some of these things, are there, are there times where we have to worry that we might kill off a whole bunch of microbes or are those populations during the grow growing season so dynamic that they'll just sort of bounce back and we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, so um, they are quite dynamic. So if but if so, if you're in, um, you know, a nitrogen side dress or something and you were, you know, you will see a decrease in your microbial populations, kind of a transient decrease, and then they, t they tend to pop back up. Um, we are doing uh, at Guelph um, all pretty much all of the soil sciences are working together with OMAFRA on this big topsoil project where we're sampling topsoils all across Ontario. And we have seen pH as the number one driver of diversity across, across Ontario. And what we see exactly that Bobby said is that you get this decrease in the organisms. Um, in on so in some um, Ontario soils that we're sampling, we get pHs of like four and five, and you do have a definite decrease in the bacterial populations. Um, so, so it was interesting to see because we don't really see that that big of a change in a drop in diversity normally. But pH is one thing that definitely affects the microbes. But I think in an agricultural system, for the most part, if it's just you're adding an amendment and you'll have like a, you know, our soils are quite buffered, so your pH is going to come back, and I think your microbes will come back too. Yeah. Okay. Um, soil pH is in the fours and fives. Like that isn't a forest floor. That's okay. Well, now I don't, I don't feel so bad about mine. Anyway, um, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, my students were actually kind of thrilled that we, because if you read a soil microbiology textbook, they're always like pH is the biggest driver of microbial diversity, but we are usually in agricultural soils that are like 
pH yeah. seven. <laughs> and so I'm like, ignore pH, ignore pH. And then we actually had like a range enough to see this, this difference. So it was, right. they were excited. But we're yes. yeah, I think something else that might be important to think about for microbes with pH is that microbes love to live in pores. And so their own metabolism can change the pH in their immediate environment, but it's very transient. So nitrification, for example, conversion of nit or of ammonium to nitrite produces hydrogen ions. And so in the very localized environment, it will change the pH. And if you don't have buffering capacity in the soil, then that's when that that kind of a chemical reaction starts to have lasting impact on the microbial community. Mm, okay. Um, I, I really do wish that we could have um, picked your favorite microbes. Um, but Bobby won't even give me one. But this is, but it does bring up, I, many of us, I think, if I can speak for everyone, and I can because I'm the host, um, you know, many of us, when we think about soil microbes, we're, we're more used to thinking about pathogens and the bad stuff. Um, but not necessarily, and as the two of you have outlined here, there is so much we have learned and so much we have yet to learn. Um, and some things we can change very readily, some things we can't. Uh, pH we can adjust, but we can't significantly change it necessarily. I, I wanted, I'd want to sort of end on uh, from that testing part, and, and Bobby, you've alluded to it as well, and I mean, both of you are actively doing research. At the farm level, at the sort of for agronomist soil testing, these sorts of things, what are we missing as far as testing that if you could wave a wand and say now we can test for x or whatever what would be this what would be the tool that you would choose or what would be the test that you would create bobby you can go first unless nitrogen mineralization hands down <laughs> yeah. how much nitrogen is going to mineralize out of the organic matter and be plant available in the upcoming growing season wouldn't for sure that, wouldn't that be nice yeah. 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 I mean, we know we have this huge pool of organic nitrogen in all of our soils and a tiny little pool of plant available and that turns over really quickly. But predicting how much is going to come um, out of the organic nitrogen pool through mineralization has just stymied us for decades. So that would be my number okay. one. <laughs> okay. I like it. Very practical. Carrie, how about you? Hmm. Um, I'm going to go a little different maybe and say that I would like, so there are more and more um, lab services available where you can sequence your, your soil microbiome. And so a farmer can go and get their soil microbiome sequence and see a profile of what that looks like. And I would say what I would like to see is, uh, you know, a better way that we can interpret that, that data, because right now, it's just a blast of like 10,000 sequences. It doesn't really mean a lot. And so I think if we could start getting at like, these are the, these are the functions that we would like to see. These are the indicators. These are, this is the structure of the community that, that is gonna be good for your soil or your agricultural soil or your corn or your so I think that's what the, the next step is. And I think that would be really useful because I feel like Right now, we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. So for both those things, um, we shall try. All right. Um, if somebody, I know we're working on them. So if we could, I, yes, that is one of the things that, um, so for both of those things, obviously for end mineralization, we can sort of test after the fact and get a handle on what did mineralize, but we don't really have the chance to predict it necessarily. Um, and yeah, reading, well, people want help reading soil tests. So let's just add a whole other layer of things we don't even know about. That's that's a great idea. Anyway, I bet you it looks cool. Um, okay, so, uh, so we are rapidly running out of time here. This has been um, incredibly fascinating. And as I said, just sort of the beginning of this conversation and this is this definitely is going to be something we're going to come back to um, several times over this year because there is just so much to think about and to unpack and uh, to predict on these things so i did want to uh, send a huge thank you of course to bobby and carrie for joining me tonight i really do appreciate it thank you Thanks. for having us Yes. And uh, Francois still says he's sorry. Anyway, uh, no, that was great. So I do I do want to send, of course, a, a big thank you to our, our 
everyone in the chat, all the great comments and all the great questions. Uh, there's certainly some that we will tackle in other episodes. Um, and uh, hey, if you've got other questions, you can send them to me, uh, lsmith at realagriculture.com. I can always forward them on and uh, let me know if there are things you want answered in upcoming episodes or if I can send them along, I will. And of course, thank you to our show sponsors for making this all happen. And we will be back to, or, sorry, next week, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, Drs. Charles Geddes and Francois Tardif are going to join us and talk about beasts, those terrible herbicide resistant weeds that we're all trying to kill. Um, if, if you two could come up with some sort of soil pathogen that kills just water hemp and kochia, you would be bedillionaires. Okay, <laughs> so let's if you can work on that. All right, thanks everyone for joining Another. us tonight. We'll be back next week. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>